This morning we are talking about God cannot be blamed. God cannot be blamed. You heard Brother Stewart reading this morning from Galatians and God said He will not be mocked whatever a man sows or whatever a person sows that will they also reap. I think all of us are very much aware that since the dawn of time, people have been blaming their mistakes on something else. It's called passing the buck. And it's surely one of the things that people do best. In fact, we learn it at a very young age. Last Sunday night I mentioned to those here about the little boy I saw on TV. Well, no, it was on the, the Fox News thing. But they had this little video about the little boy who had marked on uh, the wall with a crayon. And when his mother asked him if, if he made that mess, he very quickly said, no. And she said, well, who did make this mess? And just as quickly he said, Batman did it. So we learn early. We are quick to place blame away from ourselves. When there is some guilt involved on our part, we try to make ourselves look better by making something else or someone else look worse. Now basically, we pass the buck in four different directions. We try to blame circumstances. We try to blame things. We try to blame other people. And incredibly, we try to blame God. We blame circumstances when we say, well, I couldn't come to church last Sunday because I had to work overtime. Yes, I did volunteer to work overtime. But still, I had to work. We blame things when we say, well, I meant to come to church last Sunday, but we have an outlet at our house that has a loose connection, and I was afraid that it would cause a fire. Yes, it's been that way for three years, but I had to fix it. We blame other people when we say, well, I couldn't come to church because I had company. And they didn't want to come to church, and we couldn't go off and leave them. And then, incredibly, people blame God. Ever since the Garden of Eden, when Adam said, Lord, it's your fault for sending me a woman who caused me to disobey. People have been trying to blame God for every human folly. Woody Allen is an entertainer, I guess you might say that, who is an avowed atheist and likes to declare it. He is forever saying, very sarcastically, I might add, if God would just speak to me just once, if God would just reveal Himself to me, If God would just show me a miracle. If God would just give me a glimpse of life after death. Now, of course, he doesn't acknowledge that God has done all of those things through the Word that He has given us. It is quite popular for people to say, well, if God would just operate a little differently, if God would just make the circumstances more favorable in my life, if I just had one good opportunity, if God would just make everything more clear to me, then I would believe. But do we know what the Word of God says of people when they make statements like that? The Bible says that it is a lie, plain and simple. 
And what I want us to see this morning is why people are lying when they say, if God would have acted differently, then I would have acted differently. So let's go this morning to a very powerful parable Jesus told us about two men. It is found in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, and it begins with verse 19. Listen or follow along. This is Jesus speaking. And He says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus who was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and see, seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things, but na- and Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all of this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from you. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they will not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one should rise from the dead. This parable is very powerful because it provides for us the most graphic, the most ultimate insight we have concerning actual existence after actual death from the lips of Jesus Himself, who is the only one, of course, qualified to tell us about such things. Now what we have here are two men who lived and died, but they had vastly different experiences after death. The two men were also vastly different in their lives. Jesus said one was rich with all the trappings of the rich, all the power, all of the finery, all of the worldly attention. The other is a beggar. He sits at the gate of the rich man and wishes that he could have just the scraps from his table. Furthermore, he is a miserable sight physically, with sores over his body, which Jesus said the dogs came and licked. The two men are surely very different. They are at the opposite ends of the social spectrum. They are about as far apart from one another as two people could possibly be. But there is also another great difference between them. Jesus says one is godly and the other is not. And as we will see, this is the difference that really makes a difference. This is the difference that ultimately matters more than anything else. In fact, it is the only thing 
that ultimately matters for them and for us as well. Then Jesus tells us that both of these men die. No matter how far apart they had been on earth, no matter how much one had, no matter how little the other had, they both die. You see, death is no respecter of persons. And if the Lord delays His coming, His return, it will come to all of us, no matter what our station in life is. Hebrews 9.27 says it is appointed once for people to die and then comes the judgment. Death is the great equalizer. All of the power and all of the prominence, all of the prestige, all of the wealth that commands so much favoritism on this earth, listen, will be of no value whatsoever at the moment of death. Worldly position will provide no favorable position over those who are of poverty or low degree or any other situation that the world is so prone to look down on. And there is one thing we also need surely to understand. The Lord doesn't punish anyone for being rich any more than He rewards anyone for being poor. Having or not having is not what makes the difference. It is only what a person has done with Jesus Christ that makes the difference after we die. So Jesus tells us, these two men went to different places after death. One went to a place of torment. The other went to a place of paradise. And when Jesus speaks of these two men, He is actually talking about the spirits of the two men because the spirit of a person is the true you. It is not your physical body that's the true you. It is the spirit that is the true you. The Bible says death takes place when the spirit leaves the body. The physical body just returns to the dust of the earth, but the spirit returns to God who gave it, the Bible says. The spirit of a person does not die with the body. The spirit is conscious after death. The spirits of the righteous go to a place of happiness. The spirits of the lost will go to a place of misery. The place of the dead is called Hades in the Bible. It's divided into two spheres. One for the saved, the other for the lost. The place of paradise for the saved, the place of torment for the lost. You see, contrary to what Many would like to believe death is not the end of all things. The man in torment was not asleep. He was not unconscious. He was not annihilated. He was in conscious torment. People who spend eternity in the place of hell with, his, with Satan and his angels will retain their capacity to feel and to remember and to regret they didn't do what they should have done. Jesus makes it clear in this account. He says the rich man who is in the place of torment sees Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham. Now the bosom of Abraham here is symbolic of paradise. The place where the spirits of the righteous go. And he makes something of an order to Abraham. Now let's understand here also, Abraham is symbolic of God in this parable because it is not Abraham who controls eternity, it is God. But Jesus uses Abraham here because Abraham was recognized as the father of the faithful, and he still is. So the rich man says, send Lazarus over here. 
and let him dip his finger in cool water and touch my parched lips. He says, for I am tormented in this flame. Now for the rich man to mention flame leads many to think that he went straight to hell. But nobody is in hell yet. That will only happen when Jesus comes again. When Satan and his angels are consigned to the lake of fire and those who have lived under his dominion will join him in that. Nobody's there yet. But when Jesus comes, the spirits will be reunited with bodies and every person will have a body suited for where he or she is going to spend eternity. But the rich man was separated from God. And he recognized that the place he was in was a prelude to the place of hell. So Jesus is speaking as if the rich man is already there because that's what he's going to experience. Torment in flames. Now there's no doubt that this rich man had commanded great authority on earth. And now he is trying to do the same thing. Command authority. But things are vastly different now. Listen to what Abraham says. He says, Lazarus can't come to you and you can't come to him. Why? Because there is a great gulf fixed between us. Listen, eternity is fixed and nobody can pass over it one way or the other. In other words, when we stand with the Lord, where we stand with the Lord at the point of death, where you and I stand with the Lord at the point of our death, is settled for all eternity. Those in torment can never be rescued. And those in paradise can never be taken away. So the rich man says, well at least, I'm paraphrasing, but he's saying at least, Send Lazarus back to warn my brothers. Now the concern of the rich man now is vastly different from the concern he had on earth. While he was on earth, he didn't have any concern for God. He certainly didn't have any concern for Lazarus. Lazarus would have been satisfied with the crumbs from his table but there's no indication that he got any. But now this man is pleading. Pleading. He knows his five brothers are living just like he lived. And one day they will be just where he is. But notice again what Abraham says. Your brothers have Moses and the prophets. Now what that means is, your brothers have the Word of God just like you had the Word of God. They had the Old Testament, of course. But we have the Word of God. We have the New Testament, don't we? And right here is where the rich man tries to pass the buck tries to fix the blame on the Lord. In essence, he says, but the word is not enough. God, you haven't given us enough. The word is not enough. They won't believe the word, just like I didn't believe the word. But if somebody like Lazarus Somebody like Lazarus would rise up from the dead, they would believe. And they would repent. And they wouldn't wind up in this torment. You know, it is an interesting thing to note 
that it was just a short time after Jesus told this parable that He did raise Lazarus up from the dead. But there, is the rich man right? Is it possible that God has not done enough for people to believe and obey and be saved? No, it is not true. It is a damnable lie that sends people to eternity without Christ. So Abraham says, you're wrong. If your brothers won't believe the word of the Lord, he says they wouldn't believe and they wouldn't repent and they wouldn't obey even if someone returned from the dead they would still live the same way. And let me tell you, what Jesus says is absolutely true. Because people are still saying, if God would do this and God would do that, I would believe. If God would actually bring somebody back from the dead, I would believe. But Jesus says this is a lie. Because God has indeed raised someone up from the dead. And He is the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. And people are still saying, God, you're to blame because that's not enough. But do we see what the rich man is attempting to do when he says sin... Lazarus to my brothers. He is trying to blame God for his situation. God, I didn't get a square deal. God, you didn't make it clear to me. God, you didn't tell me that I would be here in this torment. But let me ask you, Who is really to blame for this man being in torment? You make the judgment. Who is really to blame? When Paul wrote to the Christians in Corinth, he said he was constrained by the love of Christ to tell people the truth of the gospel so that they could be saved. He said there was a time when he judged wrongly. He thought Jesus was a fraud. And even though he had the word of God, he refused to believe that Jesus was really the Savior the prophets had spoken of. He gave consent even to the deaths of Christians. He took it upon Himself to try to destroy the church of the Lord. But then His eyes were opened to the truth. And He came to realize the only thing that matters is our faith and our obedience to the truth of Christ. Some years ago there was a man named Turnbull who studied the cultures of people around the world, particularly isolated people. He was trying to prove his theory that all people are basically good and compassionate and loving, even apart from any knowledge of God. And one day he found a tribe of people in Uganda very isolated. And he discovered some things. He discovered that those people turned out their children at about four years of age and never permitted them to come back into the home again. If a man was walking down the road with his wife and she dropped dead, 
He not only left her lying, but he took from her body anything of value that she might have been carrying. The aged people of the tribe were also abandoned. There was no love. There was no compassion. And Turnbull had to change his thinking. He had to come to realize that apart from the presence of Christ living within a person, human beings are capable of anything no matter how depraved, no matter how cruel, no matter how filthy, no matter how vile, Human beings are capable of anything. You see, when we look at the horrible things people do with children and others, and we say, how could they do that? How could a human being possibly do that? Well, there, the answer is, Apart from Jesus Christ, there is nothing that a human being is incapable of doing. God has been telling us this all along. And instead of believing and obeying, people have been trying to blame God for the way we are. I've had people say to me over the years of my ministry, Howard, if I could just only have seen Jesus. Listen, Judas saw Him. If I could only spend some time with Him. Judas spent three years with Him. If I could just see a miracle up close. Judas saw several of them. If I could just hear Jesus speak one on one. Judas did that. If I could just one time look into the eyes of Jesus. Judas did. If I could just listen to Jesus speak of love and forgiveness. And Judas heard all the words Jesus said. But listen, in spite of all of those things, Judas didn't love Jesus. In three whole years, he didn't love Jesus and he wound up selling him for 30 pieces of silver. Yes, he tried to undo his deed. He tried to give the money back. But he never repented. He never took his need to God. He just went out and hanged himself. You see, neither Judas nor you nor I can undo our deeds. We can only go to Christ in faith and in obedience. Judas experienced all of the things that people say they want today. But he didn't believe. Was that God's fault? No, it wasn't God's fault. It was because Judas was a thief. The Bible makes no bones about it. It says very plainly, Judas was a thief. So listen, it's a lie when people say it's God's fault. He didn't make things clear. He didn't give me the right opportunity. God has done everything. We have the cross where Jesus died for us. We have the empty tomb where God raised Him up from the dead for us to give us hope and assurance. 
We have the truth that no one has ever been able to deny. Assurance of forgiveness of sin and cleansing us. We have the certainty that Christ will be with us in this life and come to claim us to be with Him for all eternity. You see, it's just a matter of our coming to the truth. Humbling ourselves and accepting the salvation our Lord died to give us. Now listen. People say, well, I'm just the way I am because that's the way God made me. God made me this way. I admit that I've got a bad temper, but God made me this way, and if I go to hell because of it, it's God's fault. No, it won't be God's fault. Because God has given us every opportunity to have salvation in Christ. And when we stand before the Lord on the day of judgment, we will never be able to pass the buck. We won't be able to say, if my neighbor was a better person, I'd have been a better person. If I'd have had a better wife or a better husband, I would have done what's right. If I hadn't had to work with all of those low-down people, I would have been a better person. We can't blame anybody else. And we certainly cannot blame God. Just as Jesus said, if a person won't believe the Word and respond to the truth that God has revealed, even somebody being raised up from the dead would not persuade them. Somebody has indeed been raised up from the dead. Our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, people who live and die lost have not accepted that truth. So the rich man was wrong. He said if somebody would raised up, be raised up from the dead, they'd believe. But multitudes upon multitudes of people don't believe even though Jesus was raised up from the dead. This morning we're going to sing our hymn of invitation. And while we do, if there's anyone who needs to believe, that's the starting point, believe the Word. Then you repent of your sin. You change your mind about Christ. Unashamedly step out and confess Him as Lord. Be immersed into His death and baptism. Rise up. Walk in the newness of life. We can't blame God. Nobody who dies lost will be able to blame God on the day of judgment. Let's stand and sing.